But uh, Anat, I'll just uh, jump in, you know. Uh, yes. Listen to your music for such a long time, so I thought, you know, I I'll drop you a line. And uh, obviously, I, I have the ECM records, and I listened to the last one. And uh, I wanted to start this talk with the Berlin Sessions. And uh, it's such a beautiful album. And uh, first of all, asking you about the band, because it's actually a band you have, right? It's a trio. And... Uh, uh, how does it feel to have a band and play with those guys together? And why those two guys? I mean, uh, obviously I know them, but still. Well, uh, we're now into 2024, and that means that we've been playing together for 25 years. Ooh, okay. So uh, how does that feel like that? It, you know, it's a family. It's, uh, it's people that I met when I was living in New York. Mm, okay. We all lived in New York. And um, so we have Gary Wong on bass, who still lives in New York um, and plays there a lot. And then we have Roland Schneider on drums, who moved back to Berlin like a year before I moved back to Israel. So for about 10 years or so, we were all living in New York, playing, having weekly rehearsals, you know, whether we had gigs or not. So it was an amazing thing that we developed really like a family and a very, very close connection. And uh, since we all live now in three different continents, so we, we only meet on the road, you know, and uh, the last few years have been very strange in the world, you know, and the road uh, situation has been lessened. And, and for me personally, also, I decided to do less of this. But I'm paying the price of seeing my uh, family less. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my musical family. I mean, of course, I have others, but this particular trio is uh, is meeting less. And the Berlin Sessions is um, uh, a direct result of that. What happened was in 2019, we celebrated 20 years. And then we put out a record on Sunnyside and mm -hmm. toured quite a bit with that. And right after that, COVID started and that you know stopped the world yeah. and um and basically the the next time we met was uh in germany um last year last year yeah it was last year we actually recorded it and put it out in the wow, same that's year. rare yeah is that right yeah i think so I, the, what well, I within a year within a year within because a year, yeah. Yeah, because uh, the gigs were before, but then until it came out, but but within definitely within a year. And um, so I just used the opportunity that we we're invited to play in Germany to go into the studio with the guys. And as you know, because you listen to it, we have two CDs, actually CDs. And um, the first one is uh, a lot of free improvisation and um, and some piece that is uh, that has some... Uh, I, musical ideas and stuff, but it is very loose. Mm -hmm. And the second series is actually tunes and songs and things that I've never recorded before, like covers. I you wanted know, to so, ask you about um, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's when like you're ready. Yeah, I did. I didn't expect Billy Joel or Level Forty Two. I mean, I love that music. I mean, I love it. You know, I, I listen to Level Forty Two. It's it's a great band and Billy Joel and all these guys. You know. But like I didn't expect you to record that. I don't know why. I somehow you didn't. But how how come you decided for that repertoire? Actually, uh, no, I, I totally understand. Um, actually, when we were touring with Color, the the CD that came out in two thousand nineteen, we uh, I had the idea of putting together an entire CD with eighties covers. Really, covers. Oh, wow. Okay. Because we all grew up on eighties pop music in in our you know, countries, wherever we grew up, in Germany, in, in the States, and in Israel. And we had a lot of that stuff in common when we went to play together jazz. And, and I feel that it's really part of my musical identity still. And um, 
I don't know, somehow I came up with the idea of putting together a whole CD of that music. And while we were touring with Color, we started rehearsing some of these tunes. But then again, you know, a few years later when we met again, the idea was different, you know, things took a different shape. And, um, but we were left with the idea of still doing some of that music. Mm. So we had to choose. And um, so we chose. I still, you know, I really haven't given up the idea entirely to do this because I, I really love this music. And yeah, it's, beautiful. it's it's a trio, a jazz trio <laughs> setting for that can be really interesting. But, um, you know, we'll see what time uh, yeah. has in store for us. No, it's nice that you chose, you, you know, I, I've heard like smells like teen spirit so many times, let's say, or, you, right. you know, come as you are when you run or some of the regular, the usual suspects, yeah. you know. But like okay. level 42, I haven't heard yet, like in a jazz I, I I mean, I don't recall hearing it before or yeah. Billy Joel, I think, yeah, okay, Kirby did it on that new standard uh, one tune, I think. But otherwise, yeah, usually people go, you know, to the, I don't know, Nirvana and, well, okay, Bad Plus did some stuff, Black Sabbath and... Yeah. But not that's 80s. Not so much, yeah, that's not so much what, what I grew up on, you know, like... Um, yeah. We tested it on some audiences in those tours in 2019. Like sometimes as an encore, we would do maybe like a police tune or level 42 or Billy Joel or, or I don't know, had some others. And we saw that people were just like really, of course, the level 42. I mean, it, it, people are like lessons in love, but you know, I think yeah. that's even better. So, yeah. No, it's it's a great. It was a great group. I mean, Mark King, he was such a yes. I mean, great bass player also and writer and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What what did you grow up? I mean, you mentioned growing up with this music, obviously. But uh, when was the moment for jazz and improvisation that got you excited? Do you remember? Was there like a specific record or how, how did that venture happen for you? Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's a uh, not complicated, but. <clears throat> intricate story I guess um, it started with a music lessons at the age of five oh, uh, yeah. not not piano just music mm. uh, my mother took me to this really special teacher here in Tel Aviv and um, she was doing stuff with us that was so creative like you know playing some music for us telling us the story behind it uh, having us draw you know, mm. to it, act it, you know, play these weird instruments that she, she built, you know, like made of percussion. And, and it was a very, very creative uh, situation. And um, I think I, I took that with me from that age on and, and kind of, it, it sort of, um, you know, I started classical piano lessons at like a year later at the age of six. But I think I kind of took that idea of creativity with me along the way. And eventually the classical lessons were fine, but they were not exactly, you yeah. know, it didn't really turn me on. You know, I didn't want to become a classical pianist. Um, and going back to that pop music, I was hearing it on the radio and I loved it. And I would go and try to play it. Had no knowledge of like, chords and you know all that just you know ear stuff <laughs> and a lot of improvisation that I just did on my own you know and and normally my teachers were like okay nice and let's go back to Chopin and uh, exactly. <laughs> and that was great you know but it was uh just a process um at the time there wasn't much jazz in Israel in terms of I mean there were some older jazz musicians or people who, for example, went to Berkeley and came back, you know, and brought some jazz, but it wasn't like it is today. Yeah. And so, um, but at the end of my high school years, um, I, I was sort of like, okay, enough of that classical piano. I'm, I think I'm done, you know, and um, my mother recognized that. I still was very musical and wanted to keep music in my life. I, at the time, wanted to dance, but it was that's a whole other story. Um, so we went looking for other teachers, you know, not the classical type. And uh, that was a process too, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, eventually found one. 
that I really liked and um, started studying with him. And, um, you know, a few months into it, I think I knew that this is what I wanted to do with life. Yeah, it was a very um, interesting, you know, I, I, I didn't think that, you know, at that age, I would know what I wanted to do. I had so many things in my head. And uh, yeah, but once I started with him and I, I saw that this, there was one other incident, incident that I'll tell you about that really influenced it. Yeah, I once heard um, late at night, I heard on the radio, um, John Coltrane playing, You Don't Know What Love Is. Mm -hmm. Once I, I, I heard that sound, you know, it was like four o'clock in the morning. I was alone in my room. I hear that sound and I'm like, okay, this is really weird. This person is dead. This is the recording, but he's in the room with me. Mm -hmm. And if you can, this kind of thing, when you play an instrument, I want to do that too. You know, like I want to be able to connect with people in this way. And there was a moment where I was like, okay, you know, I think this is the thing for me, you know, at least mm. to try. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, there there was a moment, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> moment, I, several, you know, but yeah. I, yeah, I, I think, you know, for a lot of people that I've talked to, that moment involves Coltrane somehow, yeah. you know, a lot of people. So, somehow, I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah, but his his music, even now, if you put it on, you know, it's like... The records, uh, uh, whichever record of his, it's still modern. It, it's it's not like okay, it's dated, but it's like man, it's yeah. fresh, and that's that's yeah. so rare, right? In music, I mean that you put on a record and you're like, damn, even mm -hmm. sound wise or anything, it's just like, right. yes, yeah. I don't know what he he had something obviously, of course, but yeah, yeah. important player, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what about pianists? What, what was, uh, what, I mean, you mentioned Coltrane, obviously, then I kind of come to McCoy, but uh, yeah. uh, who, who were you influenced? Uh, who did you then discover? I mean, like on your path of. Uh... Um, there were a few, you know. <clears throat> um, it's hard to really concentrate or to, to you know, pin, pinpoint yeah. one. Um, bec and, and they're also very different, you know. I really loved. Red Garland, and I really loved oh. Keith Jarrett, and I really li like everything in between. Um, there was one pianist I really loved, but then I, I really loved his drummer even more than him, and that was, of course, Bill Evans. And uh, when I heard Bill Evans' trio, you know, that, that blew my mind, you know, not just the pianistic uh, uh, thing, but the whole approach to trio, mm. uh, to, to band interaction, to like, to how to respond and, and be together in a jazz ensemble so uh, that was a group that really really um influenced me of course you know i really loved him but the others no yeah i, I want to ask you about paul later i mean it's obviously like you had an amazing i'm sure you got it all <laughs> no, no. Like, yeah. I, usually, I usually go with the flow but yeah i mean uh, just uh but yeah speaking of paul okay i mean <laughs> Uh, I wanted to, yeah. How, <laughs> how how did that story happen with him? And uh, you know, obviously he 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 played with. Every, for me, he's like one of the best composers, also not drummers. I mean, I'm such a huge Absolutely. fan. But mm -hmm. what was the first meeting like, and uh, how did that happen? That uh... the first meeting again was through the music of Bill Evans. I remember, you know, hearing Portrait in Jazz and and just thinking like, this is amazing. Who is that drummer? You know, how is he yeah. singing on the drums? You know, like, what is that? And um, basically, I started searching him, you know, and, and like following him ever since when I moved to New York, like years later. Um, so, of course, before I also heard other stuff that he's done, you know, but once I moved to New York, I was just like, every time Paul Motion was playing, I was there. And um, <laughs> of course... The band um, I loved the most and went to hear the most was the trio with Joe Lovano and Bill Frizzell. But any other thing that he's done, any collaboration, any pianist that, you know, convinced him to play with him and, and he, you know, I was there. And um, 
so it was like a, you know a dream in the closet like to to play with him one day and I never knew if it could happen I of course wanted to play with other people too you know um but then I started playing <clears throat> with uh, Ed Schuler yeah. in the band of Ayelet Rose Gottlieb so that was a project mm -hmm. that we did that Ed was on and Ed was my neighbor and we started playing together outside of Ayelet's band as well and I knew, of course, that Ed has done so much stuff with Paul. And um, one day I like dared asking him if he would, uh, like what would Paul think of, of a situation like that? Like, would he uh, agree to do anything to record, to play a gig, what? Or am I even asking something ridiculous? And he straightforward told me, um, I have to ask him, it's going to be a recording. He's going to ask you for a lot of money and he might say yes or no. It depends. It was like very, very like a uh, uh, funny answer. But I said, okay, you know, like, let's, let's move this forward. And, um, and then he asked him and it's a long story. Uh, part of the thing that led to the name of the album, a long yeah, story, yeah, yeah. how it all kind of, uh, I think at first he said yes, then he said no, or he said no, and then he said yes. I don't even remember. And I had to, of course, come up with the money and I had to, you know, he wouldn't rehearse. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That was also a situation that we needed to rehearse without him. And I was like bringing a lot of tunes that I was like, okay, is this going to work? Is this not? We might have to you know, just yep. try different things. Yeah, and uh, so that was it. Basically, the me the official meeting was like two weeks before when we went to hear him um, at Birdland with Paul Bay and Gary Peacock. Mm. It was an amazing gig. Mm. Um, yeah, and so we, we just went to say hi and so that it's not too weird when we meet at the studio. And uh, two weeks later, we went into the studio, and uh, the rest is, uh, you know, <laughs> history. How how was that like? Of for course, you? there's a lot of stuff. Ba band leading just that studio. band in the studio. I mean, amazing. You know, like uh, we did two days, <clears throat> and uh, the first day was with Perry Robinson, yeah. so part of the album is with him, <laughs> and the second was just a trio. Um, Perry and Paul have not met in like 20 years. So when they saw each other in the studio, it was just like, you know, man, what have you been doing? Do you have any kids? Not that I know of, you know, things like that. <laughs> and uh, at some point I was like, guys, I'm paying for this. Hey, can we, uh, <laughs> yeah. can we, um, yeah, they were just really happy to see each other. And, uh, and yeah, you know, like, so Ed and Perry and I have rehearsed before. Um, but even that, you know, like Perry was such a free spirit and, and amazing uh, personality and musical personality that, you know, you could rehearse something with him and then he would show up and be like, you know, oh yeah, yeah, we've done that. <laughs> you know, like, uh, but then play amazingly, of course. So uh, yeah, we just did that and, uh, one other thing that happened was that he, uh, part of the thing that he wouldn't rehearse was that he wouldn't read any music. Yeah. He never wanted to see music, to see chart charts, you know, and never wanted to rehearse. And uh, so I kind of thought, okay, how should I do this? We better start with like the more difficult stuff earlier in the day so we're not too tired you know like and Perry's still you know uh fresh and everybody's fresh so we did I don't know how difficult but you know the, the more complicated yeah. stuff first and then I saved um this tune this ballad just now for the end of the day and I thought ah this is something easy you know like I'll just leave it for the for the end so this was, this was the last thing we did the first day. And before we did it, I mean, the way it went was because he didn't know the music, Paul. Then before we played anything, you know, he would just say to me, okay, what do you want to play next? And I would say the name of the tune, which of course, you know, he didn't know. 
And he would say, okay, play it for me. And then he would like stand on top of me, you know, <laughs> while I'm playing it piano solo for him. And, you know, I'll never forget those moments, you know, sure. they were so, uh, so special. And so, yeah, on one hand, frightening almost. On the other hand, very, the way he listened was so special, you know, that you could really like mm. kind of um, get into that. So, so the last one we did was just now. And um, so I played it and then he said, okay, do you have a chart? for me and I was like yes of course of course I prepared some charts for him you know for everything but I knew he never wanted charts so I thought okay this is weird what's happening and um so I gave him the chart and the next day <clears throat> which was the the trio day he asked me for charts for every tune we did oh wow so okay. I still thought I mean to myself okay I, I'm not gonna say anything I'm not even gonna ask but this is weird you know Okay, and then at the end of the day, uh, when we wrapped it up, he says to me, um, is it okay if I take this music home? Do you have extra copies? And at that point, I was like, okay, I don't care what happens. Paul Motion wants to take my music home. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't care why, you know, I want him to have it. And I said, of course, you know, I'd be honored. And he said, are you sure you have copies of everything? I said, yes, I'm sure I have copies of everything. And then he explained why. He said, you know, I have in two weeks, uh, two sessions for ECM. <laughs> and I really like your music. I may want to play some of it. And at that point, I really thought, okay, I can like quit and <laughs> not even play one note and be very happy. Um so, you know, the rest of this, that story is that he didn't play any of my music on those sessions, but he did play the music that we recorded uh, for Manfred Eicher, which eventually led up to this um, record being released on ECM. Yeah, I wanted so, to ask you, yeah, about this connection. So basically you answered it that way. Yeah, yeah. How did you find out, find out about Yeah, that's how it happened. I mean, you know, it was... Did Manfred call you or Paul then told you? How did you find out about yeah, the Yeah, no, my, uh, hey, I, <laughs> I found out um, it was like, I think a week or, or a few days after the, re the, the session, I went to Israel to visit my family. And, um, and I knew that at that point, you know, Paul was playing this music for Manfred, but I also knew that Paul has played a lot of music for Manfred before yeah. and Manfred almost never used it, you know, or, or took it for anything. So I, you know, I didn't really have much hopes, you know, but I was just very, um, you know, touched that he thought it was worth something like that, you know, to play it for Manfred and um, that he liked it, you know, and um and then one day I get an email from Paul. Um, I played your music for, for ECM. They're interested. Call me when you return to New York. That was the, the email. Uh, you know, like uh, the excitement was uh, sure. was nothing hard to describe. I called him and I uh, uh, got back to New York and he said, okay, I want you to, because at that point, we had a lot of material that we recorded, you know, we recorded some extra stuff because like I said, you know, I didn't know what would work. So I needed to sit down and actually make a CD out of it, you know, mm -hmm. like, and pick some, some tracks and organize them somehow. And that tune just now ended up on the record in three versions. You know, there's a trio version, a quartet and a solo version, all that stuff I didn't plan before, you know? Mm. So so once I, I came back, I had to, uh, you know, to sit down with music and really make some choices and then send <clears throat> ECM, you know, an official, uh, an official CD because he played some tracks for him. I don't even know what. And uh, <clears throat> once I, I did that, I was told, OK, this is something that's going to take a long time. You better be patient, you know, because. We don't know how long, you know, it's going to take for him to listen to it and, and do anything about it. And um, 
what can I do? You know, this is what happens. So uh, I sat uh, and waited. And but it didn't take that long. I think it took about a month. Oh, wow. And that's, that's one cool. day I was out. Yeah, I mean, you know, but still. <laughs> it no, like, yeah, it's, it, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like an intense right. month. Yeah. So I remember like I was out. And do you remember those days? I don't know if you know those days where you had an answering machine at home and people would leave you messages. Sure, sure. Yeah, sure. And, and sure. a lot of work messages like uh, gigs and stuff. And when you were out, you would call your answering machine and, and get your messages, you know, and because, uh, you yeah. know, you knew that you wouldn't be home until the evening. And if you need to get back to someone, you better do it right away. So it was one of those. I called my answering machine and there's a message from Manfred Eicher and he says he wants to put this music out. And I remember I was on 14th Street, you know, in Manhattan, and I just basically sat down on the steps of some building and started crying. I remember that. <laughs> sure. I mean, come on. Vividly. Yeah. And, um, it, you know, part of the long story is that it took another three years for that to come out. Oh, on wow. Street. Okay. I didn't know that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Shit. It says when it's recorded. Yeah. 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 It's recorded in 2004. It came Four, out yeah. in 2000. Seven. Exactly. And um, you know, it was worth every moment of waiting. Um, it was an amazing, amazing experience. The entire thing. Uh, of course, that led to some more recordings with ECM and to some more playing with Paul. Yeah. And uh, it was one of the highlights of my uh, oh. <laughs> New York life. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask you already before, like, how did you decide to move to New York? I mean, it's kind of obvious. It's, you know, the capital of jazz, but still, what was the main trigger for you to do that? Um, <clears throat> when I was studying jazz in Israel with that private teacher I told you about, um, I always had that dream of, you know, going to the source and uh, and doing it there. Um at the time, most of the schools that I've heard about were really expensive, and yeah. I didn't think that would work. Then I did a summer session at uh, Eastman School of Music in Rochester, just a six weeks uh, jazz camp. <laughs> you know, yeah. I was a very young uh, student. And, uh, and then I heard about William Patterson College from different people. Some people, different people would come up to me and said, you should check out William Patterson College. And um, I never heard about it before. Um, when I got back to New York, I called them and I asked, you know, if I could come by and audition. And they said, no, 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 this is, this is not how it works. It was like the beginning of September. They were like, the, the school year just started. You should send us a tape. And if we like it, we'll invite you to audition. And I said, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm a music student from Israel. I'm here now. I need to come and play for you because... <laughs> I can't, you know, like, this is not going to work this way. So the the end of the story was the next day I came to audition for Rufus Reed, who was the head of the yeah. program, and Martin Criven, who also was running the program with him. And, um, and they accepted me. And uh, I still went back to Israel for another year because uh, I didn't have any papers ready, you know, and I, I really actually wasn't ready. You know, I just needed to uh, figure out how it's all going to work. And, uh, but, but I did a year later, I came back and, um, and basically, so, you know, I, I came to study, but after four years, I knew that I, I didn't want to go back to Israel right mm. away. I needed to see what it's like to be in New York and be on the scene and, and, play with some people and you know taste the life so yeah but of course that led to you know i was all in all i was in the states for almost 17 years so oh, it was okay. quite a few years that i tasted. yeah that's all good. yeah <laughs> how were those first new york days like i mean when did you start gigging actually i mean when you came um that were rough of course you know yeah. uh I started, I was lucky because I could play a lot of styles of music um, and read well. Mm -hmm. And when I was in college, they discovered that I had uh, 
you know, uh, good instincts for, you know, accompanying singers and, and that I read well and I can play a lot of stuff. So basically, I didn't know that about myself, but my teachers figured out that I'd be a really good accompanist for singers. Also for dancers, also for actors, but none of that was obvious to me. But once I moved to New York, um, actually, even before I moved to New York, I got a subbing gig at the Lee Strasberg Theater Institute, you know, mm. theater school, playing for actors who are either learning to sing or learning to just like use their voice in a certain way or doing musical theater or I got that job. And I, I mean, I did a, a, a sub for one class. And from that moment, it was like, you know, like I started getting gigs like that, yeah. like crazy, you know. So basically, I started having a lot of work of that kind, you know, when I moved to New York, but eventually it kind of almost swallowed my schedule. And I realized that, okay, what about my music and what about playing like the stuff that I really want to play? I needed to kind of balance it out. So the first year was like just, you know, very hmm. also you're getting out of school and you're so confused and like all of a sudden you don't know what you want to do and what about my music? What should I do with it? You know, and it was just the beginning days of recording independently, you know, without a record label, you know, putting out stuff on your own. And so it was a very confusing time, in other words. Um, but, you know, eventually, like everything, uh, I kind of calmed down and um and I started you know uh, finding my way in all of this and and figuring figuring out what I wanted yeah. to do and uh started playing with some people started um studying composition uh also in New York and um yeah just like slowly slowly <laughs> you know yeah yeah find the way and um that led to the first recording that I, I've done and it came out in 2000 and in 2000, in 1999. <laughs> um, but was recorded, of course, before that. And uh, from that on, like my trio started to to play and um, other things started to happen. So it was uh, yeah. kind of the natural kind of process. Slow. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, but but I always, you know, like it's a good question because I always tell my students, when they complain, you know, you know, about the stuff they have to do at school and the work and the load and the homework and, you know, just a lot of, uh, you know, how they busy they are. And I'm like, yeah, you're going to miss those days, you know, uh, because like when you get, out, yeah. yeah, you get out of this like, um, situation where everything is set up for you, you know, even though it's a lot of stuff, you know, you have it all figured out once you're out there, Every morning you wake up and need to like make a new plan for the day and the week and the month and the year. It's like, you know, inventing yourself mm -hmm. over and over every time, you know, like it's, it's not for everybody, no. you know, like Definitely. people who are used to, to having their work cut out for them, you know, like it's just not kind the kind of life that they can live, you yeah. know, so they'll go and be, you know, and if there are still musicians, if, if they want to do music, they'll find a way to do music, I think, in a way that will, you know, have them not have to figure it out yep. all the time. But the ones who are interested in that, so it's still very demanding, you know. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, for students, they got come go out of the cocoon, safe environment, and then you're like, shit. No one told me how to set up a tour, how to set up a record date, you know, things like that. And then you learn yeah. through mistakes and observing the band leaders. And that's how it went always. Yeah. I mean, exactly. But also, you know, the, the <laughs> world today is so different, you know, yeah. and the way people uh, go on tours, the, the way people market themselves, the way people put out music. It's very different from the time, yeah. you know, when I grew up. And, uh, you know, some people, young people see that and they think, ah, you know, all we got to do is clack, 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 clack. And um, 
and then they realize it's a whole other thing you know so yeah definitely it's yeah. like uh, when, when did you start composing you mentioned composition before and you know i love the tunes i, I, I what you have written they are so diverse also and uh do you write for the music i mean obviously uh, when you had the record with paul you knew paul is going to be in the band so the music i think kind of reflects that but do it how do you write usually like what's your process i mean probably varies but yeah um yeah it really varies um it's yeah it's really hard to um to come up with a like a gestalt you know yeah <laughs> of, sure. all right but um usually it involves a lot of time without the piano hmm. this hmm. is something i i actually like to talk about uh with my students also because sometimes they you know they feel like stuck in writing or they don't know how to start they don't know how to con continue <clears throat> they don't know how to finish and i always say you know like i really believe in the music that you hear inside you know because it's it's very obvious i use the piano a lot you know um right there um for composing as well um, but if I'm going to, to use just a piano that I always feel like it's going to be, I'm going to, to, to write what I know, Yeah, exactly. you know, like I'm going to, to go to the places I know, you know, places that I've been before, which is fine, you know, but when I write, I want to, uh, to do something else, you know, to, to bring something that is not obvious. And I think a lot of times that something is in me. <clears throat> and if I go to the piano, it will be translated into something that I already play. And so when I sit down on the couch or, or somewhere quiet and just kind of try to listen to what's inside, I think that tells me a lot. And even though the process later can be that I go to the piano and I try it out and maybe I change something and go back to the couch and you know it's kind of like back and forth i think it really helps me to um to connect myself to disconnect myself from the yeah. instrument sometimes to just kind of have a, a moment to not be busy you know and have it appear somehow um otherwise um yeah it's so it's so uh i don't know it can come, you know, when I wash the dishes, it can come when I play the piano, it can come when I'm driving in the car, and it can come uh, when I'm dreaming at night, you know, it's just like, and this is also something, by the way, <clears throat> that I, I like to say to students, it's not like, okay, sometimes you have a deadline, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you have to write a composition, and, and you, um, you need to come up with something by a certain date. And then it's kind of easy. I mean, deadlines are always good, you know, oh, yeah. they really help us, like yes. continue what we were talking about before. It's really like, okay, I have it in my book. It needs to happen. It's going to happen. Um, but, um, oh, wait, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, deadlines are good. What was I saying? The deadlines are good. <laughs> no. <laughs> because then you have to compose really i mean I, we're all the same I, i'm the same i'm like yeah of course i mean i met no but but um uh no i have to remember this is really interesting what i had in mind um ah yes that um the process of creating music or creating in general or being creative in everything you do is always there Mm -hmm. right so like if i decide okay i have this deadline <clears throat> and i'm going to sit now between 10 and 5 every day in the next three weeks and at the end i'll have something okay you know this is one way of working um but if i decide that i have no times for working you know and that music can always just like be part of my daily routine i'm not separating cooking from yeah right music 
Yep. I'm not separating driving to teach somewhere from writing music. I'm not separating anything from writing music. Then I'm open all the time. You know, it's not like, it's still good to have a deadline and be specific about the times we're going to actually work and do it. But I think the channels, if you open the channels, it's a much more uh, organic yeah. way of being, you know? So it's um, it's also something that I've learned that <clears throat> helps me be in that state of mind all the time. I agree, yeah. Or as much time I, as I can. No, but the, the, the good idea then comes, even if it's like a melody, you sing it or write it down. I mean, I love those. I, I love the night ones always, you know, when you wake up and it's like, Sadie, dude, Dabi, oh, fuck. And okay, that's it. Then next day I'm like, oh, shit, that's exactly. amazing, Sometimes. you know. I love that. Exactly, yeah. Sometimes it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's it, it happened in your sleep or something, right? And you, yeah. you wake up with it and it is. I had those moments. Yeah. I, I lost so many ideas at night. Like I was like, yeah, I'll write it down in the morning. Of, of course, it's, it's gone. Like it's nowadays. It's probably better to record it, right? Because yeah. ah, you're not gonna start writing. I used to write it down. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. No, but now you know that's another thing. Like, who writes it down on paper with a pencil? Except me. Maybe you too. I do but... the initial ideas always. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so but so, yeah sometimes i just also want to like ah i'll just record it but then sometimes you kind of lose the context and it's not yeah. really so much what you uh, had in mind but i also believe that you know like if it's really good and needs to be there it will somehow manifest into something uh -huh. yeah exactly at a, at a certain point yeah yeah i agree yeah it's it's hard uh, i mean I always like to like to talk about composition because you know it's just it, it, I think it's such a funny. It's easy in a sense, you know, if we sit down now and write a tune. I mean, it's we know the the the, the elements, right? Like write a ballad, okay, sure, but like not every tune is going to be special. So that's that's what I'm always curious how how you get that you know something that you're yeah. like, oh man, that's a good one. And... I think, you know, when we, like you say it, uh, when we sit down to, to do something specific, it's very dangerous sometimes, you know, because we, why is it specific? It's specific because we heard it done this way so many times. Yeah. And then it's much easier to go into those uh, routines, you know, Okay, this is my A. I'm going to repeat it. I'm going to do a B and I'm going to go back to the A, like uh, just as an example, right? So, <clears throat> and it's going to be eight bars each section, you know? And then when we play it, we're going to um, improvise on the form and go back to the head. Yeah, that's... All these things, they're just habits, you know? Like all these things, they're, they're, they're habits that have proven to work well you know, I'm not saying they're not and they're important and they're, you know, the, the mothers and the fathers of our, our art form, but they're not the only way to, oh. to do something. And I think that if you open it up, you know, for something that comes, I mean, what's coming from inside me is, of course, coming from outside, too. I'm part of the universe. I'm part of my collective memory has all of this stuff in it, you know. But maybe if I'm not like sitting there with a goal in mind or in some kind of task oriented situation, maybe something more special, you know, can mm. come out. Yeah. And this is why I like to separate, you know, myself from the the instrument, because I think, yeah, yeah and then, you know, I'll go to the instrument and, and figure out what I played. And so many times, you know. I'll be like, I don't even know how many bars this is. I don't even know what time signature this is. You know, like, you know, if I play it, I'll probably need to figure it out pretty soon what's happening so I can, you know, do something with it. But once it's in my head, it's like, wow, I can hear things that maybe I wouldn't play and mm -hmm. then go and play them and then, you know, really check them out and see if they're possible. That's true. It's yeah. more fresh this way. So. Yeah, yeah. No, no. It's... It's, it's it's an interesting process. I mean, I, I've read once, uh, I think Mark Strand or Robert Creeley, one of the US poets, he said, like, you write five good poems in your life. Those that are really 
you know, the cream. And the rest is like, mm -hmm. it, it can be okay still, but like the five is like the crown. And I'm always thinking about that. It's, when I look at the tunes I've written, it's like maybe two are like, that I can repeat with any band that I put it and it works. Some don't, yeah. you know, and, and it's it's an interesting one. I mean, very. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Uh, and not, not to take more of your time, like uh, what what's still on the schedule for you for this year? And are you preparing a new record or uh, some touring going on or what's what's happening there? Um, unfortunately, what's happening here is uh, very, very <clears throat> negative at the moment in terms of where yeah. I am. I'm in Israel, as you know. And um, the spirit here is very low. So in terms of concerts and stuff, yes. I'm not doing much right now. I've done some um, fundraisers and stuff like that. I do have something coming up in March, which will be an interesting uh, thing uh, with some Israeli music. It's just a, it's really? a new thing that we, we're starting right now. And um, I'm curious to see where it's going to go. Um, but in terms of uh, later on, it's it's actually all unknown at the moment. Okay. Um, it's actually the year, the twenty fifth year of my trio, the one that we talked about in the beginning. And um, <coughs> although I haven't really planned any touring for us, we do have um, a film that is being made about the trio and the oh, process beautiful. of the sessions. Yeah, and um, I'm hoping that it's gonna come out this year and uh i think some conversations not exactly like the one that we're having right now but yeah. you know between us and stuff are, are taking place in that Beautiful. so i think I love it's stuff. always interesting to see. yeah and uh, so i think some stuff will happen around that um but otherwise there's a lot of yeah un unknowns right now yeah i can so yeah. Well, we'll see. But I'm I'm in a situation right now, even um, like I said um, in the beginning. Uh, regardless of the situation in Israel, I've done a lot of touring and um, reached a point when I turned fifty, which was exactly COVID year, twenty twenty, uh, that I decided that I didn't want to do uh, too much of that anymore. Um, I'm still. You know, when I'm invited and I, I want to go, I go, but not much extensive touring and uh, the glamorous I, I hear you. <laughs> road life. I hear you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it's really, it's a wonderful thing. And especially when you're doing it with the right people. And, you know, that's, that's like 90% of it, right? Because you spend... Yeah so much time and effort and and everything on it and it better be with the right people you know people that you want to spend time with plus you know most of the hours in the day that you're on the road you're not playing right you're just traveling or or whatever with with those people so i'm really lucky you know not just lucky i i think i chose the right people yeah. you know somehow to be around me because it was really important for me um but now it's not so uh i'm not like dreaming of much more touring it's not really where i am yeah, so yeah. I'm I hear doing... it. <laughs> yeah yeah i think yeah. yeah i don't know if it comes for everybody i mean some people continue touring but but a lot of people you know i think reach a point um where they're just like okay you know this is nice to be at home yeah. and play music and and nowadays <clears throat> like what we're doing right now you know, music can reach people in an instant, no matter where you are. And I'm actually kind of looking more forward to that, like experimenting with some more recording, even maybe at home. Um, I'm thinking of a solo record at some point. Yeah, um, I'm, 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 yeah I really, I think it's, it's, it's time. Um, I've also, you you might be surprised, but I've also started singing a little bit. Really? Uh, oh, wow. Doing, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing, it started with the work that I'm doing with um, a singer, songwriter, and an, a wonderful 
Argentinian guitar player who lives here. Um, he's a popular singer here and we've performed, we've been performing a lot. And somehow I was convinced he sings and, and I sing some harmony with him. And then they started pushing me to sing on my own. And I don't know, somehow something yeah, opened on. up. There. So it might be part of it. We'll see. But uh, so I'm kind of going more in, in this direction now. Yeah, there's no rules. I mean, you know, yeah, beautiful. <laughs> Look, yeah, but the, the records at home, I mean, it's so easy. I, I have a studio here. I mean, studio, you know, you buy three good mics. That's it. Uh, it it's yeah. really easy nowadays and computer. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I did that. I, I bought those mics during during COVID and I yeah. haven't done much with them. Um, but I'm I'm kind of feeling it now. So yeah. we'll see what happens. Yeah, definitely. Super. Thank you <laughs> for sharing some of these stories. They're really nice to hear you talk about it. And Thank you. Yeah.